Alrighty guys, so my name is Hunter Nieto, this is Shane Burton, this is uh, Michael Watson. We are, as a class, we did an audit, we ran an audit on the SCDOT. Um, so the audit on the SCDOT, it was really hard to, uh, in the beginning to actually kind of find out what we should focus on, what we should look at, um, you know, where things should be. So we ended up focusing on um, a few what we found is key components uh, as far as how the SCDOT was ran. So we um, we also compared them to the national uh, DOT. So the things we ran um, for the SCDOT, we ran on other national DOTs as well. Um, the first one being structural composition because we figured if we couldn't find out how this thing was ran, it almost didn't make sense for us to actually do this. Second we did was funding. Um, we weren't really sure where South Carolina stood on, uh, on funding, how much we got from the state, how much we got federally. Uh, we wanted to see that, and we also looked at where we spent that money, which is the allocation here, which kind of goes hand in hand with our funding. Um, another thing we looked at was our state infrastructure banks. Um, these are kind of banks that are alternative funding that just give a little bit, of, uh, give a little bit more funding for more expensive road uh, projects. And then we also looked at revenue sources. So we've got funding, we've got allocation, we've got our, our SIB. We, you know, we've got to find out where this money is coming from and how we're getting it. This touches on a little bit of taxes. This touches on um, uh, other programs that the state is running that allocates for DOT. So South Carolina's roads, based on the metric we used, um, they were ranked 35th out of uh, 50. Now these were factors on uh, safety, con uh, congestion, and condition of roads and bridges. Uh, this, and this was compiled by Reader's Digest, however, they used the most recent federal data uh, compiled by the government to quantify these actual ro uh, road rankings. So I know the source itself may seem questionable, however, when you get deep down into it and you pull up the, the data they used and see how it was quantified, uh, this is actually one of the best measures we could find. Um, so the next thing we, we did is we got the we got all 50 states data, but we figured you know it didn't really make sense to actually talk about every you know every single state in the United States because why would it make sense to compare South Carolina to the state that was right above it? We don't want to be we don't want to jump from 35 to 34. We want to jump from 35 to somewhere in this top 10. Um, so as you can see here, we've got the top 10 states. We hyper focused on these. Um, one, you know, the one through ten, one Kansas, ten Illinois, um, and that was again. These are based on the congestion, road and bridge condition, and safety as well. Um, we also focused on the bottom ten because we didn't we didn't find that it would make sense to really do this without having the bottom ten on there as well and seeing where they stood on each of the four or five categories that we uh, compared South Carolina to them as well, which was funding, whether they had a SIB or not, um, things like that. So here's some of the structure. We're going to start off with structure here because we felt like you know this is kind of the baseline how the DOTs were ran. Uh, one thing that we did find is for the most part the commission for each DOT was um, from the top ten. I think nine out of ten of them they had their commission or commissioner appointed by the governor. Um, this is something that we found to kind of be you know this might this might be a, a method behind the madness here. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of them actually have members of the DOT, the entire members of their DOT, uh, appointed by their governor. However, we have recommendations later that may say things should be done otherwise. Uh, and I, I, again, as, um, as stated, as you can see, um, DOT director appointed by governor, um, commission appointed by the governor as well, uh, another Nebraska State Highway Commission, eight members appointed by the governor, approved by legislature. So, as you can see, a lot of the DOTs in the top ten are kind of ran by the governor. Um, this is this actually in our eyes seemed like a pretty good idea. So uh, later in our recommendations, we'll touch on a little more on how we think the government should have a hand in the DOT. Uh, and then there's the bottom ten states. So again, as you can see, DOT commissioner appointed by governor. Ten members appointed by governor, secretary of transportation appointed by governor. So it's just kind of rampant. So we didn't actually see 100% that there was maybe a real method in the top ten or bottom ten that stood out to us. We kind of just 
we kind of saw, hey, you know, maybe all these states are doing this because it's practical, and it may not be the top ten are doing this, and the bottom ten are not doing this. Um, so the South Carolina structure, um, well, the, actually this talks about the structure that I just mentioned. Of the top ten states, nine of, nine of them have a commissioner or secretary of the DOT appointed by the governor, and then of the bottom ten, all ten of them have their um, commissioner or secretary of the DOT appointed by the governor. And of all 50 states, 33 states have governor appointed directors or secretaries of the DOT, and this includes commissioners as well. Um, so like I said, it doesn't really seem to be a method to the madness here, or really even seem to be any kind of co continuity. It just seems that, hey, if their state wants it that way, it happens to be that way. Um, but, but for the structure of South Carolina, we actually have a secretary of transportation who is appointed by the DOT commission. However, has used to be appointed by the governor. So Nikki Haley actually has appointed this DOT uh, secretary, who is Christy Hall. Um, however, in 2015, the gubernatorial appointments were expired. So that that like bill or piece of legislation had expired. So now they are the, the secretary of the DOT is actually appointed by the DOT commission. Um, and the DOT commission. Um, is another is, a, is an oversight of the SCDOT. They pretty much run um, the entire SCDOT. They um, they are chosen by delegations from congressional districts. So, for instance, uh, our state legislatures from like the fourth or uh, first whatever con con uh, congressional district, those are the legislators who get to vote on the members of the commission. Um, and then, so to get on this commission, it's kind of a kind of a, a backwards system, kind of you have to go, you have to go in by almost someone you know. It's kind of a hard, hard place to get into. We've got this thing called the Joint Transportation Review Committee, or in short, the JTRC, which is how we'll refer to them from here on out. The JTRC, they screen the applicants. Um, but the JTRC consists of ten members, eight from the General Assembly, uh, so four from the House, four from, or no, five from the Senate, three from the House of Representatives. So that's your eight from General Assembly, and then two from the state at large, which is appointed by the House of Representatives, uh, speaker, or Speaker of the House of Representatives. So what's really odd about this is the JTRC, when you apply to the JTRC to run for the commission, so you actually don't get to run for the commission and then the JTRC really say, oh, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't. The JTRC, before you even think about starting a campaign to run for the com commission or anything, JTRC screens you. And they require five years of experience in uh, areas of, like, such as law, engineering, uh, construction, and then there's this word management uh, down at the bottom. And management could really loosely be defined as anything, uh, you know, retail management, anything like that. So my thing is, is the, the JTRC, they kind of have complete autonomy in who gets to run. The issue we have ran into and seen with the JTRC is there will be a handful of candidates interested in running for the commission and it'll disqualify all of them but one. Uh, so for, for us it seems a bit of a conflict of interest and it seems, seems, seems a bit backwards for us. Uh, so when, when it's an elected position we think you know, almost anyone should have that right but we'll touch on that more later when it comes to our recommendations. Uh, I'm going to toss it over to Shane who's going to talk to you about funding. Uh, so. Uh, like he said, we're breaking down the top ten, the bottom ten states. Uh, so funding, we uh, we looked at both the federal and the state side of funding. Uh, here we have the list of the top ten states and their federal funding, um, all in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the average for the top ten states was uh, just over three hundred million dollars in federal funding. And uh, this federal funding, the main purpose of the federal side of the funding is for road repairs, bridges. Uh, potholes uh, throughout all the states. Um, that's the main purpose of the federal funding that we found. The bottom ten states uh, drastically different numbers. Uh, they have just over a billion dollars in federal funding. Uh, that is a huge, huge difference between the top ten states at just over 300 million to 1 billion. So <laughs> we tried to find a correlation with that. Uh, Maybe the federal, they get, states get more federal funding because um, you know, it's recognized that these states are struggling with their roads. Uh, maybe they need more funding. Um, but that's very, very hard to tell. Um, but that is our assumption that the worse the states, the more funding they're going to get from the federal, federal government. 
South Carolina, on the other hand, has $588 million in federal funding uh, on average every year. Um, so, as you can see, South Carolina being at 35th, kind of in that middle, middle range between all 50 states, uh, they're also in the middle range with the uh, federal funding. Uh, so, that kind of adds to our assumption to the worse the state roads, the more federal funding they're going to get. So, it's almost on like a scale. So, we're finding that there's a, uh, the, the worse the roads, larger the number, better the roads, smaller the number, South Carolina's right in that middle there. Uh, for the state funding side of it, uh, the top 10 states, they're averaging at just under $1 billion from state funding. Uh, this could be, um, this is collected from taxes, it's collected from uh, uh, different types of fees that the state in, um, implies on the taxpayers in the state. Uh, bottom 10, again, we see a different drastic uh, number, uh, much larger, is at $2.7 billion and state funding. Um, South Carolina, once again, right near that uh, happy medium uh, at $517 million. Um, so they're actually a little bit less than the, than the average of the top 10, which is a little odd. It, again, that's hard to find a correlation with the funding and the state of the roads on the state funding side of it. But like I said, with the federal funding, we're assuming that the uh, the worse the roads, the more funding you're going to get on the federal side. So, Michael's going to talk about the STIB. Yeah, so the, the STIB, or SIB in some places, the SIB stands for the State Infrastructure Bank. And the way that the SIB works is it's a revolving infrastructure of investment funds. It's really, it's a bank that's established that gives money to um, to the Department of Transportation for each state that has a SIB. They give the money to them in the form of loans, partial or full, and also uh, loans on credit that would then have to be paid back. Um, these are established and administered by states. As we'll see a little bit later, um, it's not in every state. So there's certain states that have them, there's certain states that don't, and that's just because they decide that they want to or they decide that they don't want to. Um, what we, what we saw when we searched through the top 10 and bottom 10, the top 10, um, only two of them don't have state infrastructure banks. The rest of them do. Uh, and, and we first came in looking at this idea of funding, thinking that just more funding is going to be bad or more, more conglomerations and banks and corporations are going to be harder, uh, uh, negatively impacting a state. But what we realized was, Actually, the presence of the state infrastructure bank seems to be a good thing. Because when we look at the bottom 10 states, they're kind of 50-50 divided. Some of them do, but it's not most of them that do, and it's not most of them that don't. So it's not a strong correlation, and it's not a strong connection. But we did see, um, we did see that the top 10 appeared to, appeared to be better in that sense. So South Carolina does have one. And, and as we said before, uh, 33 of the 50 have state infrastructure banks. And, but because there's no direct conclusion available in that area, we realized that it was going to be better to audit the structure of our own STIB as opposed to just getting an idea of the structure of every STIB. So our STIB is governed by a board of directors consisting of seven voting members. Uh, the, one of them is the chairman of the SCDOT commission, uh, who's Mike Wooten, and then two directors appointed by the governor. One director is appointed by the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Uh, one director also comes from the House of Representatives, but is an ex officio member, meaning that they don't have voting rights, but they have speaking power on the floor. Um, one director is appointed by the President Pro Tem Poor of the Senate, uh, <laughs> which is really funny because the president pro tempore of the state senate is a guy named um, Hugh Leatherman. And he, he's actually also on the STIB for South Carolina. So I think the only plausible reasoning for this is that he actually appointed himself to it. Um, and then there's another member from the state senate who's appointed by the president pro tempore of the senate, but they have ex officio status. 
And so, according to them, according to the titles and codes that run our STIB, their goal is to select and assist in financing major qualified projects by providing loans and other financial assistance for constructing, improving highway and transportation facilities to the public. And then they also have this little thing at the end that's called economic development, though in their own PowerPoint, they have a, two asterisks next to it where underneath it says, economic development doesn't really have a definition to it. So like, they, they have no specific way of saying, this is what economic development means, and this is how we're going to measure and rate economic development and how it's going to develop our economy on projects. So it's there, but it really like, it's, a, it's an empty word because there's no meaning behind it. And it's even further, we're able to see even better that it's empty because their financial assistance application process has some problems to it. One of them is that it has to be a major project in excess of 100 million. So some people have looked at this and they've said, okay, we can understand that, that it needs to be up here, but it creates a scenario in which they're prioritizing amounts that are so high and um, against what is actually necessary, what needs to be done. So they're not necessarily focusing on fixing potholes, but they're more so working on fixing things like the Ravenel Bridge or uh, I-528, I, I believe, 526. Additionally, they have to provide some public benefit in enhancing mobility and safety, promotion of economic development, which we said before is kind of a wonky term, or increasing the quality of life and general welfare of the public, which again is kind of hard because it, it almost borders on this utilitarianistic idea where, okay, we have this util or this like um, measurement that's going to be used to understand how well everyone is, uh, which you can't, you can't put that into a metric very well. But upon receipt of an application, the evaluation committee within the STIB reviews the application and ranks the project based on 39 different criteria that they have. Uh, and that's based on Act 114, which is a, uh, it's a federal uh, program, or it's a federal act put onto states. And the way that Act 114 works is that it requires different um, groups within the state to follow these 39 criteria when approving projects. The problem is, is that Act 114 isn't actually binding on the STIB. The STIB doesn't have to follow Act 114. When they do, but they do because they choose to, because they think that it's maybe the best idea. But any given day, they could, by a simple majority, decide, okay, we're not going to use Act 114, we're just going to pick whatever project we want to do. So we'll say later with recommendations, it seems like maybe something needs to be done in that area. Um, but after that, the committee then makes a recommendation to the bank board for consideration. And that's the long, wonky process that we have to go through to actually get something funded from a STIB. And so with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Shane, who's talking about revenue and sources. <clears throat> so, like I was talking about before, uh, with the state and federal funding, um, we looked into the where these um, where this money is coming from, the sources of revenue. Uh, so we looked at and we saw that the top ten and bottom state, uh, top and bottom ten states, average around six major sources of revenue, and that can include fuel taxes, uh, vehicle registration fees. You know, you go down to the DMV, register your car, you always pay that extra tax. Uh, that, that's also a source of revenue for most states. Uh, toll roads, anytime you go over a toll road, toll bridge, um, a lot of that money is used for the roads, uh, most of the time actually. Uh, interest income and general funds, and um, I, the one I found interesting was traffic camera fees, uh, although South Carolina isn't huge on traffic cameras. I think I've maybe seen one in Columbia before. Um, but a lot of states are, uh, like I know Washington, uh, New York, Connecticut, a lot of those states have the traffic camera fees. Uh, so that's one thing we did find in the top 10 and bottom 10. Uh, South Carolina has four major sources of revenues. Uh, we get a lot of money from fuel taxes, uh, toll roads, 
I wouldn't say a whole lot of money from toll roads because there's not a whole lot of toll roads in South Carolina. Uh, general funds and the registration and title fees. So here is a breakdown of how much money is coming from each source. Uh, so you can see the biggest chunk of our, our, um, our source of revenue is non-federal aid. Uh, this could be from, uh, this could be part of the Act 98 um, with our state revenue. Uh, Act 98 was imposed in 2013, uh, which uh, gave, pretty much gave the STIB, South Carolina uh, Infrastructure Bank, $50 million a year to be used on road repairs, bridge repairs, um, and the STIB would take that $50 million, they would match it, and they would use that $100 million every year to work on the roads. Um, like I said, it was, it, it came about 2013. Um, as of yesterday, 25% uh, of the planned roads and bridges that they planned on fixing, uh, only 25% of it is completed right now. And the SEDOT website, their uh, optimistic estimation date of completing it all is next July. So that I find hard to believe. <laughs> so they're not on good rate right now. Uh, the second largest is the motor fuel use fees. Um, you know, you go to, every time you go get gas, uh, there's always that little tax that's added on there that nobody really pays attention to. Uh, a lot of that money goes towards fixing our roads, which I find is a very good source of revenue, um, seeing how everybody buys gas. Uh, and you can see the other uh, federal reimbursements and you know miscellaneous and sales tax and all that. Uh, next, give it back to Mike, and he's going to talk about the allocation where all this money is being dis distributed to. Right, so, you know, as we transition from allocation, I want to add that on the, on the state level with the taxes and the things that are coming out of, um, coming from and to the SEDOT, to South Carolina, they have these taxes that are put into this big general fund, and within that general fund, it gets to the point where the money that comes out of it, you can't be 100% sure that money that is going towards it is actually going to what it says it's going to. So one of the things that we real, that we saw was last year there was a big hullabaloo about a um, about <coughs> gas tax and we when it was presented they were saying this is going to be great it's going to go straight towards fixing our roads um, it's going to be better than doing an income tax because because we're not really going to be taxing the people within our state we're going to be taxing tourists and visitors, people who are coming through. Um, and so within that particular area, it's because it goes straight into the general fund, we saw that, you know, once it goes into the general fund, how it's allocated is, is not particularly uh, conclusive. We can't say where it's going. And so, but with, uh, the, with South Carolina and with the SCDOT, the way that they're allocating their money one of the largest areas is in uh, this federal program area, which we weren't 100% sure where that was, but I think the general idea was that's going to fix interstates, things that are um, related to interstate commerce, re related to how South Carolina connects to uh, North Carolina, to the other states that are around it. Um, the, and then the second one down, which is significantly less, if I might add, is state maintenance, and that's only about 25%, whereas uh, federal programs, I'd say roughly around 70, 60, 80%. Um, it's, not, it's not ideal, I don't, I don't think, but we'll talk more about that when we get to recommendations. Um, altogether, this chart and the previous one, so if we take the sources of revenue and then we subtract the way that revenue is allocated, it comes out to giving us a, uh, a budget deficit of $85.2 million. Which, okay, we can understand if they're overspending because I mean, our own government overspends every year. Uh, so nothing new there. 
while it might not be wise, we, really, we went on that same page where we got these charts and we saw a, uh, a little Excel spreadsheet with, like, that was hidden, we, we got onto it, and it gave us total revenues and thousands and total expenditures. Uh, and we found this kind of troubling because it seemed to suggest that with the revenues and expenditures all together, actually we've got a surplus of almost $400 million. So we weren't sure what this was, what this meant, um, because like I said over here it was a 55.2 million deficit but then on the same website they're also reporting a four hundred million dollar surplus um, and, is, and is, the, is the fund balance a total balance over time rather yeah. than an annual yeah that's end of the year yeah. but you know what I'm saying is is that balance carried over year to year to uh, to create that 400 so yeah so basically you see here excess uh, of revenues over expenditure so this is for the year so this is for, for the, the current year. year is there and yeah. then at the bottom and is this the is, total and then this over is time the this is the fund balance at the beginning of the year so that's these two uh, right together so, but even then this is still inconsistent because this shows 191 million dollar uh, budget surplus whereas the two previous graphs have shown a budget deficit yeah hmm. And part of, part of the thing that is significantly troubling is, you know, at the beginning of the year, it shows almost $200 million, and then by the end of the year, we make it to almost $400 million, which doesn't make sense if we're running a deficit in terms of how we're budgeting everything out. Um, and it may just be that we're misunderstanding the data that's been given, but I don't think that's the case because it's pretty pretty clear the way that it's given. Well, either independently makes sense, but combined, something's missing. Yeah. yeah. There's something Yeah. There's something missing here, between here and here, that's either that's okay. lost in translation that they're not giving us. Um, and we found this troubling because, you know, on a website where you're talking about how you're spending your money, you'd think that you would be direct, you'd think that you would be straight to the point in explaining, this is how we're spending money, but it was, we had to we had to like build a wall and climb over just to get to these numbers. Um, and so ultimately we couldn't really determine which was most accurate because both came from the same website. And so with that, we'll turn over back to Hunter. So <coughs> as, you, as you heard earlier, um, we spoke on our recommendations. Uh, you know, they were brought up uh, multiple times. Uh, we're going to give recommendations on pretty much everything we just covered uh, on allocation, revenue sources, funding, and uh, the structure of our DOT. So um, we're going to start off with allocation. Uh, so as you saw, we spent about a little less than 25%, uh, I'd say, on our on our road maintenance. However, you know this. Uh, Spending money doesn't always equal better roads. Uh, you know, throwing money at a problem isn't always the, the way to solve it. However, if, if we were to fix these roads, we, had, we found a metric that $40 million um, were claimed in the past five years against the state because of road damages. So there have been $40 million in claims made against the state uh, because of traffic incidents or a multitude of other things, uh, or they're made against the DOT. So if we spend a little bit more now um, to, to fix those roads, to maybe uh, pave over some potholes, things like that, we would actually probably be able to minimize the amount of uh, dollars spent paying claims and lawsuits. Um, we could also allocate surplus funds that aren't being used elsewhere. Uh, so for instance, the budget surplus in South Carolina uh, this past year was $1.2 billion. Uh, there's a big fight uh, in the state house and the Bucks General Assembly on how to get the money for roads, and the metric that was given was $400 million. Well, with the $1.2 billion budget surplus, I think we could all agree that that money could come from there instead of raising any form of tax. Um, also, uh, we believe that the state or the South Carolina State Infrastructure Bank needs um, more transparency in reform and prioritizing projects. Uh, as Michael said, we had to build a wall and climb over it just to get some of the basic information we had about the STIB. Um, also, um, to be noted, uh, you know, the, the member who, the leading member of our, of our, of our uh, Senate, Speaker uh, Pro Tempore, 
uh, Senator Hugh Leatherman. He is also uh, the, a sitting member of the JTRC. So he has his hand in the JTRC and then he has his hand in the STIB as well. So he's pretty much got his hand, both hands, you know, very, very into the pot when it comes to transportation. But there's no, no law against that. There is no law against that, no, but we believe that that can be a breeding ground for corruption. Not that there is corruption, but that gives us a breeding ground with corruption just the way the JTRC functions. Uh, him being the most powerful senator we have, uh, you know, there may come certain, I, I, I don't want to make a large assumption, but there could be certain perks that come in with, you know, voting his way, saying yes or no his way on the JTRC, especially when it's, you know, if you're a new congressman and you get selected to, uh, you know, to be on the JTRC. Okay, program. so I know that you're not accusing him of anything, but now I, academically, for the sake of the academic exercise, am asking you to speculate what could be a problem of the conflict of interest that you're So here's the about. conflict of interest I find. Um, so uh, Mike Wooten, chairman of the DOT commission, he is the chairman of the, he is from the commission of the 4th district, which okay. is where uh, Senator Hugh Leatherman is from. Okay. He also happens to be on the JTR, or he also happens to be on JTRC and the SCTIB as well. Um, so the commission was chosen, the commission chooses their um, chooses their commissioner, and it's just very odd that the two most powerful men amongst the DOT happen to be from the same legislative district. So is, is this potential for the uh, Obama-like uh, rewarding your friends and punishing your enemies kind of thing, a la Chris Christie in the bridge? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, that's exactly what, that's, the, that's exactly kind of like, kind of breeding down from corruption that, yeah. that is saying, because, you know, um, Mr. Wooten, he actually owns an engineering firm who sees a lot of a lot of state contracts come his way. So if Senator Hugh Leatherman can get, you know, has a kind of like a pet project or has a road he wants to get done, he can, you know, and of course he's going to do it for for his district because you know, hey, they're all going to love him, keep voting back in office. Our roads are great. Well, they're going to send them Mike Wooten's way, so Mike Wooten's going to keep. Are his roads any better than the rest of the state, or did you not track that? Down? That was a real hard metric for us to find, uh, kind of from. Because I, I mean, now I'm only asking you to speculate, but that would be really interesting to figure yeah. out. So because if they were, then that would that would yeah. kind of call for uh, some kind of check and balance. Yeah. So the funny thing is, is that you mentioned that I, the people I've spoken to, just from being like the political arena, uh, people that work politics in Myrtle Beach, in Conway, in Georgetown, in Horry County, mm -hmm. they love Hugh Leatherman. Like they love our roads. They, you know, they they're all for it. So you know, they were all for the gas tax because Hugh, Senator Hugh Leatherman was for the gas tax. Yeah. Um, so it's you know they, they like their roads, they like their roads getting done. So it's kind of like this thing here, you know, in Charleston, everybody complains about the roads. The roads are terrible around here. Dorchester Road is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, but then up there, it's a completely different climate. It's a you know completely different uh, air about things up there. They, they love the roads. The roads are fine. But that's because they've got two of the most powerful members of the DOT or transportation. I, I would there. want the roads to be sound in Myrtle Beach. Yeah, as well there's, as a, yeah. there's a lot of revenue that flows into Myrtle Beach, but there's also a lot of revenue that flows into Charleston. So yeah. something yeah, yeah. So could be that Actually, later in our, um, we, we've got some structural recommendations as well. Okay, for keep the on. Team, I'll so. stop interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes on to the revenue sources. So as I talked about earlier, um, the $400 million budget surplus, or the $1.2 billion budget surplus, that $400 million that the Senate had projected should be used for our roads should come from that. We agree. However, we think what can what should really one thing that should come is 